And it was heavy work, I mean, it was brutally heavy work. Now these men are pulling these hides out of the pits by hand. They get all kinds of strains, sprains, back injuries, because the work was so heavy. Sitting here in the home of William Beggs, who was one of the great leather barons in Woburn's history. He built this home in the 1880s and lived here until his death in around 1916. And what a magnificent sight for talking about the history of leather. I'm in what they call the round room or the music room, which they use for entertaining. Woburn and tanning have a long and storied association. Starting way back when brothers John and Francis Wyman started tanning operations right near here in Central Square in the year 1666. The last tannery in the city closed in 1988. In between were hundreds of tanneries and patent leather shops and thousands of laborers, mostly immigrant laborers, who earned their living in the trade. If you lived in Woburn, from, especially if you lived from the 1840s to the 1950s, you worked in a tannery, and if you didn't, your father did, and if he didn't, your brother did. Leather was king in this city, and it dominated the economic, the political, and the social life in this community. The process of tanning in colonial days involved placing the pits in the ground, digging them out, and covering them in the winter with timbers and layers of spent tan bark to keep them from freezing. The bark was ground in an iron pot mill, which was driven by horsepower. The hides were handled in and out of the pits only once in several weeks, and six months or more were consumed before they were tanned enough to work. After shaving the whole hide down to the desired thickness by hand over a beam, a long, tedious process, the leather was stuffed with tallow and oil and then blackened with steeped sumac leaves and iron filings treated with vinegar. In addition to the Wyman brothers, colonial period tanners included Gershom Flagg, who opened a tannery off Wind Street in 1673, and John Tidd, who opened a leather shop in North Woburn in the 1740s, as well as David Cummings, who started a business on Bedford Road in the 1750s. The descendants of David Cummings would make their mark in the Woburn leather business for the next 150 years. His direct descendants, including great-grandson John Cummings, would so grow the business on Bedford Road that the entire area would become known for many years as Cummingsville. Another descendant, grandson Moses Cummings and great-grandson J. Otis Cummings, would build a tannery on the mill pond way up on the present-day Woburn Burlington line. In the winter, they also harvested ice on a commercial basis. The pond today essentially forms the Burlington Reservoir. Another descendant was Eustace Cummings, who built a large tannery at the corner of Fowl and Conn Street, and his descendants would operate at that site well into the 1930s. The ability to get supplies and hides, and the ability to easily ship the finished product made a big difference, and that's why we see a boost of activity with the opening of the Middlesex Canal in 1803, and an even bigger boost in business with the coming of the railroad, first to East Woburn in 1835, and then to Woburn Center in 1845. The Irish came here after the Plato famine, then the South End and Woburn, and you had hundreds and hundreds of them. They had no education. I mean, the only jobs they could get is laborers. They didn't have to speak English, they didn't have to know how to read and write. They just had to have a strong back, that's all. 
the national economy really took off in the 1850s, and just then, of course, the first waves of immigrants were arriving from Ireland, fleeing the potato famines. This merging of increased demand with abundant cheap labor resulted in tremendous growth in the local leather industry. It was boomtown in Woburn, and as one writer later described it, the manufacturers made money almost without exertion. And the Civil War fueled even further growth, with tremendous demand for belts, shoes, saddles, straps, and other products made of leather. Great fortunes were made throughout this era by men such as John Cummings, Charles Choate, Abijah Thompson, Ebenezer Blake, Eustace Cummings, and a host of others. The immediate years following the Civil War saw a slowdown, and the 1870s saw a pronounced recession in the industry. But then the 1880s saw another mini boomtown. Waves of immigrants were still arriving, not only from Ireland, but also from Italy, Greece, the Scandinavian countries, and from Eastern Europe. This abundance of cheap labor helped fuel further growth in the industry. Older tanneries expanded with the old Thompson Tannery on Water Street, for example, becoming one of the city's largest under the ownership of Thompson's son-in-law, Stephen Dow. Newer tanneries appeared on the scene as well. The James Skinner plant on Green Street, the Bryant and King Tannery on Conn Street, the John Crane shop on what we now call Crane's Court, and the W.P. Fox Tannery between Fowl and Green Streets. Also starting in the 1880s was a firm that would eventually come to dominate the industry in the region, Beggs & Cobb. The Bryant and King Tannery is interesting in that they had moved to town from Clinton, Mass., after their factory out there had burned. Coming with them from Clinton were about 25 workers of Swedish descent, they made their homes here and within a few years founded and built the Swedish Evangelical Church on Montville Avenue near the center where some apartments or condominiums are today. The church later changed its name to the Church of the Open Bible and built a new church on Wind Street just over the Burlington Line. Tanneries were in all parts of Woburn, but particularly in the south end along the railroad line and in North Woburn in the Webster Street and Ashburton Avenue areas. And housing patterns and ethnic housing patterns followed suit. So you saw, for example, the south end develop in a somewhat more congested manner with more affordable housing stock and with lots of Irish, Italians, and Greeks, virtually all of whom would walk to work in the nearby tanneries. And the same thing happened in North Woburn, where primarily Italian immigrants built housing in what they still call the village up in the Ashburton Avenue area, within walking distance to the tanneries and to the very much related business of Merrimack Chemical Company. The wealthy tannery owners were in anything but congested housing, of course, and they built some magnificent and elegant mansions of the day. Charles Choate built his home at the top of Warren Avenue in 1850, it still survives today, though it's hardly recognizable as part of the old Choate Memorial Hospital complex, which is now the New Horizons facility. John Cummings built a mansion at the corner of Bedford Road and Cambridge Road, with only a few stone walls remaining today around the perimeter of the estate. His wife, Mary Cummings, went on to donate the estate and surrounding vast acreage in the Woburn Burlington Line area to the city of Boston and it is still owned by Boston today, and somewhat in the news of late. Gone today as well is the magnificent Stephen Dow Estate, which sat atop Warren Avenue with a majestic front lawn which ran all the way down to Main Street. Homes on Myrtle Street and Caulfield Road now occupy the site. The magnificent mansion burned to the ground in 1938. James Skinner's home on Montfield Avenue near the present-day high school, still stands today, 
as does the stately home of William Beggs at present-day 620 Main Street, as well as that of Griffin Place across from the Beggs estate and now numbered 627 Main Street. The whole place was dangerous. And you had to really be on your toes. Where you go to work and you have to change your clothes. And when you get through, you have to change your clothes back to what you wore in. Then when I get home, I had to stay out in the hallway, change my clothes out in the hallway to another set of clothes. And, and I'd hang them. The ones I wore to work, I'd hang them outside, go to my air out, because there was a lot of smell there. Stunk. It is well to remember that working conditions, particularly in the 19th century and early 20th century, were very tough. There were obvious risks every day, with sharp cutting tools and machinery easily slicing a man's fingers off or maiming an arm. And there were less obvious risks as well, with long-term exposure to chromium and other chemicals on a daily basis. It was just too bad if a man got hurt. He, was, he, was, he had a big problem. Some guys were, at, were crippled for life. Even from the first of it, I mean, here you have a hide that weighs 60 pounds. You take it and put it in water, and you have to you soak it for three days. That hide is like a wet blanket. It weighs 100 pounds. Now these men are pulling these hides out of the pits by hand. They get all kinds of strains, sprains, back injuries. And this is, this is what the most common thing was because the work was so heavy. A lot of them uh, had hernias. Even when we were running it, one of the, the worst, uh, the highest types of accident rates we had were hernias and uh, strains. Because even with, the, even with the level of mechanization we had, there were certain operations that you, you really had to do by hand. And uh, there was, it was heavy lifting. You have to remember that during the late 19th century and early 20th century, throughout that entire era, if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. It was that simple. If the tannery burned down, you were out of work. Uh, if you were injured, there were no workman's compensation laws at the time. If you were laid off, there was no unemployment compensation. You just didn't work and you had to rely on the help from your neighbors to survive. There was no company doctor. There were no health benefits. There were no pension benefits. Life was tough. It was a long work week in a gritty environment. And yet, it was the mainstay of employment for thousands of Wubanites during that era. And then there was the famous Loring Tannery disaster of 1895, which occurred at the former Bryant and King Tannery on Conn Street. A boiler exploded, five men were killed, scores were injured, and the rest of the workforce was out of work for months, as most of the tannery was essentially leveled by the blast. Fires were very prevalent in the area, the Stephen Dow Tannery on Water Street burned to the ground in a spectacular blaze in 1894. The tanneries had a great vicarious effect on the growth of other businesses in the region, most notably shoe manufacturing, machine shops, knife companies, and degreasing companies. The shoe industry, which obviously utilized leather for most of its products, went hand in hand for many years with the tanneries. The most notable 19th century shop was that of George Simons and Nathan Simons, a large four-story rambling structure located on Main Street opposite present-day Myrtle Street. It manufactured heels, inner soles, and assorted shoe pots. A notable manufacturer of shoe stock in the early 20th century was the firm of C. Walter Marion Company, which had an establishment for many years on Jefferson Avenue. The machine shops were vital to the leather industry, continually manufacturing and developing new and improved equipment for local industry. Joel Whitney formed Whitney Machine Company in Winchester in 1844, and he and his son Arthur were at the forefront of developing newer equipment, such as an unhairing machine in 1883 and a fleshing machine in 1892. James Buell started Buell Machine in the late 1850s, and the company would operate for the next century 
located as of 1874 on what would later be known as Buell Place off Main Street in Woburn Center. In later years, it would be located on Federal Street behind the Woburn Five Cent Savings Bank. In 1899, the Woburn Machine Company started operations on Main Street in the South End. Co-founded by Tom Merriman, his son-in-law John Martin and his son John Martin Jr. would run the company for close to a century. They introduced the new splitter machine and developed a national and even international customer base that allowed the company to outlast all of the Wuben tanneries. It finally closed in the 1990s. The Wuben Degreasing Company was formed in 1907 and operated into the 1970s at a site in Cummingsville at the intersection of Willow Street and South Bedford Road. And then there were a number of knife and tool manufacturers, all of whom thrived during the heyday of the tanneries and all of whose fortunes pretty much mirrored that of the leather industry. Among them the John L. Fowle Company, first on Cedar Street and later on Salem Street, the Clemson Knife Company, the Edward S. Lyons Company, and Bailey and Blendinger, located at the corner of Prospect and High Streets. As the fortunes of the leather industry went, so went the fortunes of a host of related or dependent businesses in Woburn and the surrounding areas. Men, in order to support their families, had to work six days a week. As I say, they they were lucky if uh, by 1900 they were making 20 or 25 dollars a week, the highest paid man. By the late 1890s and into the first decade of the 20th century, there were some unsettling times in the industry. In general, the era was full of union activity, strikes, ups and downs with layoffs, and the like. A somewhat interesting and explosive labor dispute of the decade of the 1910s took place in 1915. The site was the W.P. Fox and Sons Tannery, and it started as a rather minor labor dispute over job conditions. The strikers were mostly immigrants of Greek and Italian descent, and after a few days of an idle shop, management decided to hire strike breakers. These weren't just any strike breakers, however. No, the management of the W.P. Fox and Sons seemingly went out of their way to add fuel to the fire and found some Turkish workers to replace the Greeks. Violence erupted on the picket line, with numerous assaults and fights and gunshots being fired. Extra police patrols in the area of Fowl and Con Streets, which was referred to in the Daily Times as the Greek Colony, were ordered by Chief McDermott, and a few tense days passed. The impasse seemed resolved, and a tentative agreement was reached, with workers actually returning to the factory a few days later. To the amazement of the returning Greeks, however, some of the replacement Turkish employees were still there, and they had no sooner returned to work than they walked out once again, with a new demand that the company fire any Turkish workers at the plant. Within a few hours, the company caved in, announcing that all the Turkish workers, and there were about 15 of them, had offered to quit. The Turks were let go, and the Greeks returned, and production and peace resumed at W.P. Fox and Sons. This period also began to see the heyday of patent leather, or Japanning shops as well, and this aspect of the leather industry really took off. Where does that term come from, Japanning? Is that, is just, it, what it, just what it means. Do you, ever, do you ever see Japanese hat? No, I mean, in what respect? I mean... What's, what's the pertinent feature of Japanese hat? It's the lacquering. Oh, lacquering, the okay. The lacquering and that beautiful finish they put on everything. Okay, yeah. So this is why they call it Japanning, because the leather. You ever have a pair of, when you were a little girl, have a pair of Mary Jane shoes? Yeah, oh yeah, patent With leather patent shoes. Leather shoes. Right. This is where all the patent leather came from. The 1920s saw another boom town in the leather industry, and although they didn't quite know it, the tanneries had what was perhaps their last hurrah. But what a run it was. There were at least 26 major tanneries or patent leather shops going great guns throughout the decade. To name more than a few, Algonquin Leather, later the site of Lord Tanning Company on Ashburton Avenue, American Hide and Leather, later Snyder Leather on Conn Street, with another American hide and leather shop on Crane's Court, the Crescent Tanning Company on Cedar Street in East Woburn, 
Cummings Leather on Fowl Street, Lily Leather on Conn Street, Dorrington Leather at Main and Fowl Streets, two leather shops owned by the Murray family, a tannery on Campbell Street and a patent leather shop on Salem Street, the John Riley Company on Salem Street, Robertson Leather on Easton Avenue, Thayer Foss Company located on the old Skinner Tannery site on Green Street, the Tolman Fox Company on Fowl Street, Beggs and Cobb with their main plant in Winchester on Swanton Street and two patent leather shops in the south end of Woburn, one on Cranes Court and one on Cross Street, the Keene Patent Leather Company on Barton Lane in the south end, the Ballad Japanning Company on Jefferson Ave, the American Japanning Company on Bedford Road in the Cummingsville area, the L.P. Bond Company on Webster Street, Hopkinson Leather Company also on Webster Street, the Peterson Merrill Company, a patent leather shop also on Webster Street, and the Alfred Peterson Patent Leather Shop behind his home on Bow Street. It all came crashing down in the 1930s, and only a handful of major tanneries and patent leather shops survived. Times were tough, with significant layoffs and then plant closures. Union strikes were prevalent. Most tanneries just went out of business. Others, seeking cheaper labor costs, moved out of state. Alfred Peterson moved his operations to Waterboro, Maine in the mid-1930s. Lord Tanning Company, which had employed close to 500 people in its busy years, followed suit, moving to South Paris, Maine in 1938. The Cummings Leather Shop on Fowl Street did the same in 1939, moving to Lebanon, New Hampshire. Al Peterson had an interesting life. He was mayor of Woburn during the very depths of the Depression in 1932 and 33, And though his middle name was William, he was nicknamed Alfred Welfare Peterson because so many Woobanites had to seek public assistance from the city during his tenure as mayor. He enlisted during the Second World War, even though he was 48 years old at the time, and he served with Patton's Third Army Group. He was with U.S. forces that liberated Dachau Concentration Camp, and he was actually put in command of the camp for the first month or so following its liberation, while they tried to restore the residents of the camp back to a basic level of health. He always had a reputation as a fair employer while he owned the patent leather shop, and he was among the first of the owners willing to recognize the new unions that were forming in the 1930s, although he did ultimately seek lower labor costs by moving to Maine. People back those days, you get a job at Beggs and Cobb, they go out and buy a house because that, that was the number one uh, company in the, in the world, you know. The production needs of the war economy during the early 1940s brought some steady work for the tanneries that had survived the Depression. But a serious recession hit in the late 1940s and times were again tough. War shortages had brought about new products, those made of plastics and synthetics. The demand for leather was way down, and the 1950s saw some notable strikes, significant layoffs, and finally plant closures. The Murray shop on Campbell Street closed, and it was the end of the line as well for Beggs and Cobb, which shut its doors for the last time in 1957. The main plant in Winchester burned down in a spectacular fire a couple of years later. The semicircular, multi-story Parkview Apartments, now condominiums, occupy the site today off Swanton Street. Another patent leather shop, perhaps familiar to some older residents, was the so-called Garassi Leather Shop, located on Easton Avenue, roughly on the present-day site of the fields to the rear of the new Shamrock School. It was sometimes known as the Garassi and Kumanale Leather Shop, 
and also called the Wuben Japanning Company and the Wuben Patent Leather Company. A tannery or patent leather shop under one owner or another had operated at that site since the Pollard Tannery had opened there in the 1850s. The Garassi Leather Shop closed about 1960 and burned to the ground a year or so later. My name is Alice Spinozola Boza. Uh, I'm the wife of Joseph Boza. I live at 5 Church Street in Woburn. Uh, Joseph worked at Woburn, Woburn Hide and Leather for about 25 years, starting around 1930-38. Uh, and then uh, he worked on that flushing machine, and, uh, you know, it was steady work. And then when that, clo when that shop closed down, put a lot of men out of work. Woburn Hide and Leather, up at 1071 Main Street in North Woburn, limped along into the 1960s. The Murray's other tannery on Salem Street went into the n later 1970s, and that left one tannery, the John J. Riley Company, on Salem Street at the corner of Wildwood Street. Business continued there, under new management the last few years, until the doors were closed on December 31, 1988, and that closed the doors as well on an era that had started in Woburn with John and Francis Wyman in 1666. And how long did you work for Riley's? Uh, about 45 years. And what did you do Spent for Riley's? Spent a whole lifetime I know, there. <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing. Um, what did you do for Riley's when you first started there? I, I worked in the office. I, I started as a timekeeper, and I, uh, for most of the time, I was personnel manager. I did the hiring and firing. I was a uh, safety engineer, an industrial engineer. Did a lot of buying in the latter years, bought the materials, and uh, uh, let's see, 1979, Riley sold the business to Beatrice Foods. They tried to run it for about five years, and in 1984, they sold it back to Riley again. In the 85, Riley sold it to myself and four other top managers in, in the company, so the five of us ran it from 1985 until the end of 1988, uh, when... Uh, the market was just uh, so bad that uh, we had to get out of business. When you started with Riley's, how many employees were there? We had about 100 to 150 employees uh, most of the time. And we put produce uh, what they call a side. That's one cattle hide split in half was two sides. And each side made anywhere from 15 to 20 square feet of leather. So a tannery was rated on the number of sides they could produce. We could produce... Uh, working the pasting unit uh, six days a week, we could produce anywhere from 2,400 to 3,000 sides a day. So, uh, we'd come in uh, at the bottom level, it was just uh, mainly they would be like opening hides, moving hides, stuff like that. Then they would, they would go to hand operations like doing uh, hide trimming, or it'd be a machine operator like a flushing or an hearing machine. Uh, then uh, we would have mill operators. Now this was a little higher skill because when you gave a guy uh, an operation like a tan mill or a color mill, and he had formulas he had to follow. So he had to be able to read, and he had to follow these formulas because you could ruin thousands of dollars worth of leather by having the wrong temperature or running it too long or running too many ounces of dye in or something else. What was the process of tanning leather um, in the you know, 19th century? You know, late 1800s when we see these fires here, of this lowering fire that went up. I mean, what was their process of tanning? The process of, was about the same. Now, if you took the tannery, a tannery in colonial times, the man wanted to tan a, a, a cow hide, he could get the cow from the farmer. But then in order to tan, he had to have a, a source of water. So this is why all the tanneries in Woburn were located along the brooks, all these brooks and, and uh, running through Woburn had tanneries up and down them because this is how they get the water supply to do the tanning, but it's also, unfortunately, the way they disposed of the wastewater, too. People had no idea of what this was going to lead to. With a small operation, it probably wasn't too bad if you had large brook and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of movement and everything. And, and the little bit that they put in there probably wouldn't did amount to anything. But 200 years later, when you get huge plants here, and it was a huge output of 
uh, water soaked with lime and uh, the effluents and uh, it, it caused a problem. And what are they doing in this picture here? This is like from 1912. So that's these, and, and they walked along this. One of them yeah, oh yeah. fell in there. Well that, well, that was only about three feet deep, oh, three okay. or four feet but deep. I mean, the chemicals, it wasn't something that. Well, would, oh, no, you wouldn't want to on. fall in there. No, but, I know. Uh, just saying, it, look it, at it. You get a burn. Water. Yeah. Because the uh, uh, water and lime is going right, to give you a burn. Right, right. And they but, don't look like they have great equipment on in those photos. Well, they, they had. Uh, what do they mean? Rubber they, boots? They had rubber boots on, but then most of them uh, used to wear rubber aprons too. They're finishing the skins on that table. Yeah. They're putting the the finish on by hand. Were these? Were they just called finishers? If this was their skill that they had? Yeah. See, the, the photos like these. This is probably the only thing they did. Some of them probably spent their whole lifetime doing that one job. Really? But they did it at different tanneries. A, a cow hide is like a fingerprint. No two are alike. They generally they are alike. I mean, you can see where the neck is, where the tail is, where the two legs are, and everything. But the. Uh, well, if you split this down the middle, that's the cowhide. I mean, there's the head, front, back, tail. So did Wuben go through a phase where it was all Irish during a certain frame and then the Italians and the Greeks well, probably, came in? Probably, it was just like, just like Lowell and Lawrence and all these other places. Probably the Irish came here first. Uh, then uh, around the 1890s and 1880s or so, they started getting the Italians here. Then the Greeks came in, some Turks came in. When I started working there, there was a lot of Irish. In fact, we still had some Irish there that could speak Gaelic. Uh, in the 40s, we had uh, 11 Flaherty's, and they all came from Galway, and I think they all came from the same village. <laughs> I had two Mi three Michaels. So I had Michael P, Michael J, and Michael. Because <laughs> I couldn't tell them on the payroll <laughs> which one was which. <laughs> Hard workers? Oh, they were great workers. Great drinkers, too. They loved, it. loved the area. <laughs> but isn't that the American way, though? Well, that's, that's, you know, that's one, one, one group moves and the other one moves up, and it's just always right, been that way. These are the people that come in with no education, Nothing, no they skills, work hard, right? And they have no way of getting a job. And, and their relative says, you know, I don't know how many letters I signed saying, you know, uh, so in those days, if you if you wanted to sponsor somebody, you had to get the employer to say he had a job for you, you know. Now, in the country, in this country now, where does the leather business stand in the United States right now? Well, actually, there's only one tannery left in the United States. That's up in, uh, in Maine, I think, the uh, uh, company up there is, is the only one making it. And now most of the leather is tanned uh, in e either Europe or a lot of it tanned in China, South America. You know, my father, Leo, worked in the tanneries from when he came home from the end of the Second World War until he went on the police force in 1951. So for those five or six years, he'd walk to work in the tanneries, walk to work with his father, who spent many of his adult, much of his adult life working in the tanneries as well. And years later, you know, my father would be in social circles or at a party, and people would be talking about going to college and this one and that one, and he'd say, oh, I went to BC. People would say, Leo, I never knew you went to Boston College. They say, oh, not Boston College, Beggs and Cobb. I graduated from Beggs and Cobb. And I think a lot of Ubernites graduated from Beggs and Cobb. What? What's your full name? John Bedanza. I was born in Uben. Where? I was born in Bill and then I moved to Burlington, the Cummins Estate. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mary Cummins? Yes. Now, <laughs> did you graduate from Uben High School? No, I didn't. I had to go to work. When did you well, go to work? How old were you? I was 16 or 17 years old, I think, 16 or 17 years old, I had to go to work. And which one did you go to work for? I worked for Kaplan's, but right on Green Street. Mm -hmm. I was, I was uh, uh, toggling. Toggling? Toggling, yeah, you stretch the leather on the frame, and you fix the frame and you shove it in, you know. Yeah. I, I, I was toggling down there. Bags and cobs? Mm -hmm. Bags and cobs. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know some slack or something like that, and I landed up in North Woburn. And John, uh, what did you do at Riley's and Murray's? I was toggling up there. How long did you work at Riley's? A little over 33 years. Mm -hmm. I worked at Murray's, yes. Oh, I did? worked at Murray's too. You forget all these places. I've been all of them, all of them almost all of them.
And there was a lot of cameras here. I remember every one of them. And it's unreal. You look back, you know. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's a shame, you know. Leather was king in this city for many years. It was and will always be associated with the city. It gave many of our forebears the opportunity to support their families. It was difficult work, trying work, trying circumstances. And yet, I think when we look at some of those old pictures, we see pride in those faces. We see determination in those faces. And we see hope in those faces. Each generation that toiled in the sludge and the grime of the tanneries toiled so that the next generation would have things a little better. And I think in that sense, it still defines who we are as a community today. It's a city with a strong work ethic. It's a city that always respects the dignity of the working man. It's a city where neighbor helps neighbor. And it's a city that sacrifices for the next generation. And so the tanneries themselves may be long gone for sure, but deep down inside of us, I think as part of our being, we'll always still be tanners. <laughs>